So welcome everyone and thanks for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about what I did for my PhD research. I studied the systematics of Anopheles mosquitoes in Canada, looking for evidence of cryptic species. And I'm also going to hopefully have time to give you some other interesting, fun mosquito facts. So I'm going to introduce uh, mosquitoes to you through the way that I was introduced to it. So, um, which was primarily when I was hired to do West Nile virus surveillance in Ontario. Then I'm going to go through uh, my, the work that I did for my PhD and finish up with why I think mosquitoes are so interesting. So I started my, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph in molecular biology and genetics, uh, which is quite a stretch from where I'm at, but it's come in very handy. And then after that, I started working on the West Nile virus surveillance program in Ontario at Brock University with Dr. Fiona Hunter. And so when I first started, because I had no entomology experience, I was only allowed to do trap intake and more uh, administrative stuff, but I developed their data management system and made reports and things like that. Um, eventually, I became the senior lab manager, and at the peak of West Nile virus madness, uh, I was responsible for hiring and training and scheduling 40 mosquito identifiers, as well as sorters and administrative staff. And I was also the liaison for uh, the public health units that we dealt with. So initially, we just started out with one health unit, or a few, when in 2001, when West Nile was first introduced, um, but it later expanded to include all 32 health units in Ontario. So it was a very, very big um, endeavor th that we undertook there. So, and while I was doing that, we discovered an introduced species called Aedes japonicus. So uh, it was first recorded um, and found only in the Niagara region in 2001. Um, in 2002, we found it in Niagara and Hamilton. Um, a few, like nine adults as opposed to one in 2001. And then in 2003, it just expanded to uh, be present in nine different health units and we had 22 adult females collected. And in 2004, it had spread to 20 health units as far north as North Bay. Um, so it was, it, it, as soon as it got to Ontario, it it established itself and spread very fast. And the number of adults that we collected is pretty low because light traps are run from dusk until dawn. And because Japonicus are daytime biters, um, they, don't, we, they weren't really picked up in the light traps a lot. But they were very abundant as we found in Niagara when we collected larvae. Um, they're container breeders and so they breed in things like used tires and rain buckets and whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, in Ontario now, if you're out gardening during the day, <laughs> these are not your friends. <laughs> um, also at that time, I started taking pictures of the photographs because we had to hire so many people to identify mosquitoes. There aren't 40 <laughs> uh, people that were familiar with how to do it, so we ended up having to hire um, a lot of people with no experience. We had a lot of people that didn't even have backgrounds in science at all. So I started taking pictures of the, of the mosquitoes to go with all of the steps in the key just to help these people um, make it easier for them to learn how to identify mosquitoes. And so that's kind of how this photographic key to the female mosquitoes of Canada started. So as it grew, I started going to the National Collection in Ottawa and getting all the additional species that occurred in Canada but that weren't present in Ontario. Um, to make a key for all the whole country. And then I took all of those specimens to the Royal Ontario Museum and used a very fancy camera microscope auto montage system. And <clears throat> so when I was doing this, I wasn't really intending to publish it. So I just used PowerPoint <clears throat> to do it. And then when the Canadian Journal of Arthropod Identification was formed, I asked if I could submit it and they didn't have a PowerPoint sort of platform, but now they do. So if anybody wants to make a key to their bugs using PowerPoint, you can. So I'll see if this link works. So basically the way that it works is, um, <clears throat> so this is the table of contents and you can go to, there's a description on how to use the key. There's some nice illustrations that a girl in our lab drew for us. And so basically 
you just start at the key to the genera, and then whatever your mosquito looks like, if it looks like this one, you click on that picture, and it'll keep taking you until you get to the right genus. And then when you get there, it'll take you to the key to the species for that genus. So to give you a little bit of background about the types of mosquitoes that we have in Canada, um, the four groups that you see at the top are the four main genera that are the most common, most abundant that we collect. And um, so they're also the ones that are vectors of diseases if, if they are capable of transmitting them. So Anopheles mosquitoes, even though we no longer have malaria in Canada, we used to, and they're the species that would vector that. Um, Culex are the primary vectors of West Nile virus and 80 species. Um, some of them can act as bridge vectors for West Nile because they will bite birds and humans. So it's possible for some 80 species to pick up West Nile from a bird and then turn around and spread it to a human that way. And Culicetas, they're a little bit more rare in Canada, but they're pretty abundant in BC. And it's nice to see them. There was actually one new species that was uh, discovered in BC. It used to occur only in the States, but I don't know, with climate change or whatever, there's now um, Culicida particeps in British Columbia. And I think because it's the 50th anniversary of the ESB or something, but it's, it was the 50th species discovered here, so they're doing a big thing this year. The other ones down at the bottom, you're in Atania, Orthopoda, Orthopoda maia, uh, Yomaia, and Toxorhynchites. Um, most of them are just comprised of one species, but they're all very different and interesting and beautiful and as far as I'm concerned. Toxorhynchites is very interesting because it's the only one that's predaceous um, in the larval stage, and so it doesn't, it consumes enough protein by eating the larvae of other mosquitoes in its larval habitat, but it doesn't need to take a blood meal, so that's why it has that very long, curvy proboscis. So I'm going to sort of briefly talk about insect systematics and what it is. Um, so <clears throat> systematics is basically st the study of taxonomy and species and all of the different things that are associated um, with a particular species. So it can include, well, first of all, it includes their morphology, which Carl Linnaeus, a, uh, is he Swedish? <laughs> In the 1700s, you should all know him because he was pretty much the, laid the foundation for the binomial nomenclature system that we name species with. Uh, and so <clears throat> the next thing I think people probably started looking at um, was the different larval habitats. So um, for mosquitoes anyways, <clears throat> uh, sometimes you can have in cryptic species complexes, complexes of a bunch of species that all look the same, they can actually have different ecological or behavioral characteristics that <clears throat> are associated with their reproductive isolation and can um, can allow you to differentiate between species if the morphology doesn't work. <clears throat> and so the same thing with behavior. In the case of mosquitoes, it can be something like their host associations or maybe the timing of their emergence or things like that. <clears throat> um, then they started doing crossing studies where they would put different species in cages and <clears throat> see who could mate, um, seeing if there was mating incompatibilities or they would quantify the level of offspring sterility. And that started providing a little bit more information. And then in the, around the late 1800s, early 1900s, they, some insects, not all, um, <clears throat> have cells that contain polyteen chromosomes. And so polyteen chromosomes are just the replication of the chromosomes without cell division. So <clears throat> the chromosomes end up having thousands of copies all together that you can actually visualize, like you can see them under a dissecting microscope, it's very cool. And <clears throat> the banding pattern is species specific. So um, this was really important in terms of discovering uh, why, once, why malaria was present in some regions of Europe and not others. <clears throat> and then finally, nowadays, DNA barcoding, which is the use of um, <clears throat> certain sections of the DNA, certain genes or 
partial genes that are species specific as well. The nucleotide sequence is unique to, somewhat unique to individual species. And so this type of work has been instrumental in elucidating a lot of different types of cryptic species complexes. So cryptic species complexes, like I said, are groups of species that all look the same, but they have different ecological, genetic, or behavioral differences. And a good example to illustrate this is um, this species of butterfly that was, I believe it's in Costa Rica, well, it's all throughout the tropics. Uh, it was first described in 1775, and they initially thought that it was um, one species that had was a generalist feeder that the larvae could feed on multiple types of host plants. Um, but when Polly Bear and his team from the Barcoding of Life group at the University of Guelph looked at it, um, and Dan Jansen had actually been doing some natural history stuff looking at the host plants that they figured that it, they discovered that it was actually 10 different species that all pretty much looked the same and they weren't generalist feeders, they were host specific to the plant that they fed on. So <clears throat> it can be, uh, these species complexes are common in some in insect taxa and studying them can provide insight into the evolutionary processes. And it's really important in mosquitoes because, like I said, in order to successfully control a vector of a particular disease, you have to be able to identify it accurately. So this is, um, it was called like the anophilism without malaria problem, that in the early 1900s in Europe, they knew that uh, Macula penis was the primary vector of malaria and that it was present throughout Europe, but malaria only occurred in certain regions. And then in the 1940s, an Italian researcher um, did polyteen chromosome studies and found that it was actually a complex of 12 different species that all had overlapping ranges, and their ability to vector the pathogens that cause malaria were different. And so being able to accurately identify those species led to their successful control. So, <clears throat> As you can see in this map, they know what the primary vectors of malaria were in a lot of places and had done a lot of this cryptic species stuff with Anopheles, but no one had ever done it in Canada. So that's what I did for my PhD. And so there are six main species that I looked at in Canada. There's one more that was sort of a new introduction and it only, we had collected adults through the West Nile virus surveillance program, but I never collected any through my research, so they're not included in my study. And I looked at each of these species, or I tried to look at each one, using four different methods. So I started out with polyteen chromosomes and morphology, and then um, I included molecular species identification and did some ecological association work as well. So I'm just gonna sort of give you, a, try to give a quick, quick intro to the six different species that I worked with. So Anopheles barbari is fairly unique compared to the other five. Um, it's the only member of a different subgenus called Celia, and it's the only one that doesn't have a pattern of spots on its wings. Um, it's the only one that lives inside, the larvae live inside the water that fills up in tree holes, and it's only known from a couple of places in southern Ontario, um, in the Niagara region and in Ottawa. Anopheles freeborni uh, occurs only in British Columbia. <clears throat> it, um, it's common to like, pools and sloughs along creeks and marshes and things like that. Um, Anopheles walkeri, this one is unique. So <clears throat> Barbari is the most unique and it's interesting because it's larvae, uh, overwinter it, it overwinters as larvae in the tree holes. So the larvae actually can freeze solid at minus 20 degrees for weeks at a time. Um, and then in the spring, when the thaw is out, they just start going again. Um, <clears throat> Freeborni and most of the other ones overwinter as adults, so they'll come out in the fall, the last generation, they'll, they'll mate, and then they'll go hibernate somewhere until spring, and then they'll come out in the spring, take a blood meal, lay their eggs, and the cycle continues. Anopheles walkeri, interestingly, overwinters as the egg, and in the egg stage, and because Anopheles mosquitoes lay their eggs on the surface of the water, those eggs actually sort of stay at the interface between the water and the ice for the winter. It's 
kind of interesting. And <clears throat> they're known primarily from really large swamps and marshes and things like that. Um, Anopheles quadrimaculatus, it's at the northern limits of its range here in, just in southern Ontario. Uh, it was the most common species that I collected and it's found in a, lot, a wide variety of habitats, even really disgusting dirty water. Um, and then Anopheles punctipanus. So it occurs in southern Canada at the northernmost limits of its range in two places, in British Columbia and in the east. And there's some in uh, Manitoba, southern Ontario, Quebec, and uh, in the Maritimes. And it has the widest variety of larval habitat possibilities, um, from artificial containers to ponds to, to anything, pretty much. Um, and then there's Anopheles earlier. This is not a very pretty picture, but it basically occurs all throughout Canada. Um, some, it has been called Canada's national mosquito. Um, and even though I found that it's not very abundant, I think that it's mainly because it likes uh, woodland pools, which aren't really typical for Anopheles. So I didn't really go there to look for them very often. Um, so I did, sorry, the, these pictures aren't great either, but I, my, I did, collected mosquitoes, I collected larvae and adults. Um, the larvae, the adults, I would usually blood feed to get them to lay eggs in the lab and then rear those eggs out so that I could have egg larvae and adults um, to compare the morphology to. So I collected in British Columbia. Um, I did a little collection up in Radisson, Quebec, and I collected uh, on Newfoundland, and then I did most of my collections in southern Ontario. And so within southern Ontario, I had four main regions where I collected. Um, oops, back. So I collected on Manitoulin Island, which I called northern Ontario, not sure why, um, in Wis Windsor Essex County, in the Niagara region, and the Ottawa region. So those were my four main. Uh, study areas, but I also did some incidental collections, and I've included Long Point here just because there's some neat things that went on there. So I started with cytogenetics, which is an extremely difficult technique to, to master, which I, I can't even say that I really did after three years of trying. Um, the first year, uh, because my supervisor had done polyteen chromosome work with black flies, um, <clears throat> we thought it would be similar and so I preserved all the larvae from that first summer of collection into carnoid solution um, and spent the whole winter trying to prepare the slides and not really getting any good spreads and wondering why and then I realized that well mosquitoes aren't black flies and so um, I found a paper that talked about using live larvae so that's in my second field season I spent a lot of my time when I wasn't in the field collecting preparing polyteen chromosome slides from live larvae. And it worked a lot better, but it was still, I still wasn't being able to tap the top of a, the microscope slide and get all of the chromosomes to spread their arms out. It's, it's, I was told it's more of an art than a science. And, and I would agree because you don't tap enough and they're all jumbled up. And if you tap too much, then they all break apart. <clears throat> And then in my third year, I tried one more time and discovered that if you keep the larvae in the fridge and make them cold first, that it works better. But I still really didn't have enough. It wasn't useful to look at all of the species, looking for evidence of cryptic species, because it was just too much. So I did end up getting one very nice spread from an Anopheles early eye specimen. And I did get enough slides of Anopheles barbari that I would have been able to establish a polyteen chromosome map for that species if I'd had time. In the end, it didn't even make it as a chapter in my thesis, so. <laughs> so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about morphology. Uh, Anopheles mosquitoes are very well known for having strong morphological similarities between species, but also pronounced variation within one, um, which makes things tricky. <clears throat> when I first started identifying them, I thought, based on the morphology, that there might be evidence of three potential cryptic species here. Um, the first one, Anopheles early eye, you, you probably can't really see them. <laughs> But this here, this little dot, is called an accessory turgle plate. And these, so these two additional ones that's down here, 
they are characteristic of the species that occurs only in BC, freeborn eye. So when I found specimens that had these, I was intrigued and looked into that further. Anopheles punctipennis has this um, pale colored wing spot and there's a very uh, closely related species known from the states called Anopheles perplexans that has this wing spot but it's much reduced. And I had a lot of specimens like that, so I thought, oh, maybe we have some of these. And Quadrimaculatus, uh, it's now known as a complex of five sibling species, mostly from the southern states. And so I identified some of them using the key to those to look just to see if we had them here. And it looked like we did. Uh, so I did, some sort of a little bit more detailed analyses of these traits and I found that in Anopheles early eye, the one thing that was interesting is that in Freeborne, the spots are always symmetrical in pairs and complete, meaning that they're on all of the tergites. Um, but in early eye, sometimes there would be like one on one side and one on the other side and it wasn't always, um, they weren't always on every tergite. So the number of the accessory tergoplate um, ranged from zero to 10, and, but with no discernible pattern really to geographic region. Um, so that was sort of disappointing. <laughs> with punctipennis, so <clears throat> this is the distribution, of, the known distribution of punctipennis in North America. And this is where little spots where Anopheles perplexans larvae are known to occur. Um, so perplexans larvae are specific to alvars, which are water that sort of forms <clears throat> um, on top of rock or through rock. And it often has like a lot of calcium and whatever um, from, from the limestone. <clears throat> and which we had a lot in Alvars are pretty rare in the world, but there's quite a few in Ontario, and I found quite a few of these types of habitats in Niagara. And so since I had such, you know, 13 and 14 percent of my specimens keyed out to perplexins instead of punctipennis, I also thought that this was, had the potential to occur in Canada. <clears throat> so perplexins and punctipennis can only be reliably identified based on their egg morphology or based on polyteen chromosomes. And since the polyteen chromosome thing didn't go well and we had an SEM at Brock, I decided to look at some of the eggs. So, um, perplexin's eggs have this sort of patterning on the plastron that sort of makes this sort of the deck more sort of narrow in the middle compared to punctipennis. Um, of the 27 egg batches that I reared from isofemale progeny broods and examined, all of them were the punctipennis type. Um, I then took those eggs and reared them out to larvae and adults. And of the 23, 23 of the 27 egg batches that I reared had uh, perplexins and punctipennis types, but also an intermediate type. So. Um, and the intermediate one was actually more common. And there was none that were perplexins only. The other four were punctipennis only. Um, so that also wasn't very informative, really. Uh, and then with Anopheles crotchmaculatus, like I said, it's now known as a complex of five sibling species in the States. So this is quadrimaculatus senso stricto, and this is smeragdinus. And because smeragdinus also seem to approach the Canadian border. And because we used the keys um, to those sub sibling species, and we found quite a few of them that would have keyed out to Smeragdinus, we also thought that this was possible considering their geographic distributions. They can also be reliably identified based on their egg morphology, um, based on the number of tubercles present at the ends of the eggs. And of uh, the 11 egg batches that I did obtain from Quadrimaculatus, all of them uh, were the senso stricto kind. And because I do the eggs before I identify the females, um, it just so happened that none of the eggs came from females that would have keyed out to smeragdinus. So that also wasn't very helpful. 
So then I went on to look at different molecular markers to do, uh, hmm, to try and see if DNA barcoding and uh, could help solve my dilemmas. So I looked, the first gene I looked at was the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, which is the gene that's commonly used for DNA barcoding. Um, only that the barcoders use the 650 base pair section at the 5 prime end of the gene, and I use the 800 base pair section at the other end, just because from the literature it appeared that this end was more taxonomically informative than the barcoding region for Anopheles. And then I also looked at nuclear genes, uh, the ribosomal internal transcribed spacer sequences. So, and I looked at both. I looked at ITS2 and ITS1. <clears throat> so, with the, with the CO1, it's generally accepted in the literature that, with mosquitoes anyways, that a sequence divergence of 2% um, usually indicates different species and that all of the conspecific sequence divergences is usually less than a half percent. So you can see that most of them had sequence divergences of less than 2%. Um, Anopheles punctipennis was 0.9. Uh, Quadrimaculatus was less 0.6. But then Anopheles walkeri, the species that I didn't nearly really expect to find cryptic species in, showed a sequence divergence of 4.6%, which was pretty huge. So with for punctipennis, the 2% sequence divergence, all the specimens from BC formed a cluster, and then the specimens that were collected in Ontario formed a separate cluster. With walker eye, the clusters were um, from the long point that I showed you, Long Point Provincial Park and Manitoulin Island. And they had 8% sequence divergence, approximately. <clears throat> With ITS2, because it's not a coding gene. It can accumulate a lot more insertions or deletions and things like that. And even though they are tra transcribed, only certain parts of them are used for translation, I think it's translational processing of the ribosomal genes. And so each species had a distinct sized PCR size PCR product, um, so they could be identified pretty easily just by running a gel and not having to sequence it based on the size of the fragment alone. Um, however, with Anopheles early eye, uh, it wouldn't really sequence the an internal 450 base pair region, which probably indicates intergenomic variation. There's, multi, there's hundreds of copies of the ribosomal DNA subunits within the genome. So it's possible that some of them have insertions and others don't. Um, and also the reverse primer that I was using didn't work for the long point Anopheles walker eye. Um, so sequence divergences are a little bit different um, than with CO1 data. But <clears throat> basically I found that um, most species only had one uh, sequence that was identical for the most part, or little tiny differences. But Anopheles punctipennis had two, two different ones that were quite different from each other. Um, and same with Anopheles walkeri. So <clears throat> with early eye, even though the sequence divergence wasn't very high, uh, they did form two di distinct groups, the BC specimens forming one group and the ones from the rest of Ontario forming another. Um, and with punctipennis, uh, again, the BC species formed a group compared to the rest of the Ontario ones. Uh, Anopheles walkeri, again, it was the same difference, long point forming one group and Manitoulin Island forming another. And with quadrimaculatus, there was, they were all identical. And 73 of those had been identified as quadrimaculatus senso stricto and 16 as smeragdinus. So this led us to believe that 
uh, the morphological variation within quadrimaculatus isn't indicative of cryptic species here. I also looked at ITS-1, and it was, an, it was fun, but kind of a nightmare. Um, sorry the slides didn't really work out that well, but, um, whoops, go back. So, <clears throat> some of the sizes were huge. Anopheles freeborn A is 4,500 base pairs compared to Anopheles walkeri, which you can't see, but it was only 600 base pairs. Barbari being so different, the, my primers didn't even work for it. And punctipennis, a lot of the specimens had multiple bands indicating, again, intragenomic variation with a lot of insertions um, and repeated insertions that change the length and the size of those fragments. <clears throat> so um, with Anopheles early eye, there was too much intragenomic variation, though, so I couldn't get any uh, sequences, really. Um, with Anopheles punctipennis, they too had intragenomic variation, but when the interesting thing was that the BC specimens, they all had only one band around the 2,500 base pair mark, whereas all the ones from Ontario had multiple bands like that one there. Um, the Anopheles walkeri um, also formed two groups. Uh, when I see, when, because they, they were easily sequenced, strangely, um, and they were quite different. And then in the quadrimaculatus, they also formed two groups, but they contained specimens from both geographic regions and the sequence deviation was 55%, so I have no idea what that meant. And so, to summarize, I guess, there, I identified two putative cryptic species in Canada, Punctipennis, there's, it appears to be a western species um, compared to the eastern ones, and with Anopheles walkeri, a northern species that occurs on Manitoulin Island, and a southern group. Now I'm going to do the fun stuff. Good. Um, so this is a very fun mosquito, and off are the Uranitania safarina. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but it has shiny metallic blue racing stripes on it. Very fun. So one of the things, I'm going to talk about some things that I've done uh, and then some things that other people have done as well. So one of the things that I did that I found very interesting was uh, assessing the provincial and national general status ranks for all the species in Canada. Uh, it was surprisingly difficult, even though mosquitoes are very well studied, the, the abundance data was lacking. So a lot of times people will say, oh, well, this is common, or this was rare, or this was abundant, or this was not, but having actual numbers in order to assess their ranks was, it, was, it made things fairly difficult. <clears throat> One species that they did highlight as potentially being at risk of extirpation or extinction in Canada was Aedes alipinotum. Um, that was based a lot on what Peter Belton did, uh, some of the work that he did. And it's a species that just kind of occurred in one sort of area in Burnaby that's being rapidly developed right now. Um, Anopheles walkeri, too, it, when the key to the species of mosquitoes by Monty Wood came out in 1979, uh, he said that it was the most abundant species of the ones I was studying, but now it's definitely the least abundant. And <clears throat> it seems to be more only in pristine waters, and they like the big, big marshes. And a lot of, when I was doing my field work, I would get topographic maps, and I would look for the marshes, and I would go there, and I would get there, and it would be a farm or a subdivision. So <clears throat> in the 30 years since he wrote the book and since those maps were produced, there's been a lot of development that is definitely shrinking its habitat as well. And they also highlighted Yeomaya smithii, uh, just because it's a neat mosquito. It lives inside the pitchers of pitcher plants. And <clears throat> they, with the, the most carnivorous plants, like a pitcher plant, they, they digest, they have digestive enzymes that break down the insects and so that the plant can get at the protein and nutrients from them. But and uh, the Yeomaya smithii do that for them. So it's when the ants and other things, whatever, fall into the pitchers, they're not killed by the plant, but they get trapped and then they die and then the mosquitoes break it down into things that the plants can use. I took a course on entomology in Churchill, Manitoba. And when I was there, uh, I was 
collecting mosquitoes for fun, even those no Anopheles up there, just 80s mosquitoes. And I found some that had these yellow things stuck to their eyes, and I wasn't quite sure what that was, but Peter Kevin did. And uh, they are the pollinia from a certain species of orchid that's common uh, in that region. And so when the mosquitoes stick their proboscis into the plant to get the nectar, the pollinia gets stuck on their eyes <clears throat> and until they go to another one. And sometimes, like, when you're covered in mosquitoes, as you are in Churchill all the time, <clears throat> you can actually see all the little yellow balls on them and stuff. It's kind of neat. Um, and then another thing that I did recently was uh, I helped a couple of freelance journalists named Jean and Alan Burke uh, produce an episode about mosquitoes called Zapped, the buzz about mosquitoes for the nature of things. So at first the nature of things wasn't really keen on doing an episode about mosquitoes, um, but then they did the raccoon episode. I don't know if anybody watched that, but it was really interesting and it was so well received that they thought, well, maybe people aren't so opposed to pests after all. <laughs> and so they decided to go through with it. And so I helped provide a lot of the specimens that they use <clears throat> in the movie for, um, if you, or not the movie, but the episode, if you watch it, it's, uh, of the mosquitoes emerging from the water or being eaten by dragonflies or whatever. <clears throat> and so this is, uh, this was a study that was done by researchers at Cornell University. Oh, actually it's 2009, sorry, not 2012. <clears throat> but <clears throat> until they did this study, they didn't really think that mosquitoes used uh, that buzzing that we hear in, for mating or for courtship. And so they did some studies and put mating mosquitoes together. Um, and what they found was really interesting because the males will produce uh, their buzz at a frequency of 600 hertz and the females at 400. But when they get together, they, they interact acoustically to shift their flight tones to match each other, and it results in a shared harmonic of 1200 hertz, which exceeds the previous limits of hearing in mosquitoes. So, hopefully this will work. Mm, actually, wait. Mm. The lucky ones turn into comma-shaped pupae, which tumble about until a fully formed mosquito splits open its case and crawls out. She gets her insect blood pumping and almost immediately has liftoff. Slow motion shows that she beats her wings up to a thousand times per second. Within a day or two, she has matured. <coughs> and now, she needs a mate to fertilize her eggs. There are lots of males waiting for her. <coughs> Tracking software reveals what goes on. He's blue, she's red. She enters the swarm and flies around its lower half, faster than all the males, until the lucky one catches up with her. How do they hook up? They sing to each other, hold a male mosquito and a female up to a microphone, and this is what you'll hear. Now the flirting and foreplay begin. <laughs> um, oops. Okay. And then this is the last one. Uh, this is a very funny paper. If anyone's interested in reading the actual paper, it's quite funny that I don't know why anybody even thought to, to think of this, but uh, so it was done by Dickerson et al. At, in, at the Georgia Institute of Technology from the schools of biology and mechanical engineering. And so they combined experimental and a theoretical study to show 
that mosquitoes can survive high-speed impacts from free-falling water water drops. It's partially due to their exoskeleton and the fact that their bodies are covered in CT that are hydrophobic, but also because there are such a low mass that it causes the raindrop to lose momentum upon impact. <clears throat> and so there's two different types of blows that a mosquito can suffer if it's flying through the rain. It can get hit, they call them glancing blows on the legs and the wings, that causes them to roll and tumble around in the air, um, or a direct impact where it hits directly behind the wings and they get pushed down. And so either way, due to the larger mass of the raindrop compared to the mosquito, it falls faster, and eventually the mosquito just rolls off and allows it uh, to regain their flight. I'll show you what this looks like. <laughs> it doesn't have any sound, though. It doesn't matter. And it's funny how they did all of the calculations uh, and to figure out the force of impact and the speed with which raindrops travel. And you can see that a raindrop is about the same size, but it has a much greater mass uh, and can travel a lot faster. So like I said, the mosquitoes are covered uh, in hairs and CT all along their body and their wings and everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> that, I guess, it affects increases the surface area, and they're hydrophobic. <laughs> so they dropped the raindrop, they made the water fall at different speeds as well. So this is a glancing blow that causes the mosquito to kind of spin around. Um, and then direct hits also being possible. <laughs> but they recover quickly, and it's pretty interesting. So. So depending how and where they get hit, they'll either get pushed down or they sort of do this sort of spinning around the raindrop for a little while until they fall off. But as long as there's a great enough distance between them and the ground, they survive. Oh yeah, and then they, they tested it with a whole bunch of insect mimics, different sizes and things, and compared it. So, <laughs> yeah. if you like physics, check it out. <laughs> and that's it. So, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes? Okay. So right at the beginning, you mentioned that we had malaria in North America, and I've never heard of that. Um, how recently? Uh, it was in the early year 1900s when they were building the Rideau Canal. And uh, so I think they dammed up the canal, or they dammed up the river to build the canal, and it created a lot of standing water. And I'm not sure if maybe... Uh, immigrants who were coming to work here brought the malaria with them, but uh, quadrimaculatus and freeborn eye um, are efficient vectors of it. And they say that it was eliminated through the use of putting screens on windows. Oh. Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I forgot my notebook, notebook today, so I didn't write it down, <laughs> but you mentioned a species that you found very early on in your talk that was... Um, Quite the rare, Japonicus? Japonicus. Yeah, was it Japonicus? And what? So, what's? Are there any potential um, diseases there? Is that a vector? Of well, anything? it is interesting because it is a potential vector of West Nile, and it has specimens have been collected uh, that have West Nile virus in them. And a really interesting and funny thing that I noted about it was uh, when when the first papers came out about the introduction of the species. Um, they found it in New York in 1999 first. And so when they went to the literature, they found a paper from Japan where the species is from. And they said that the paper talks about how they would feed on birds and on mice. But it was 
it was a, under lab conditions where they were only given a baby bird or a baby mouse to feed on um, and not from natural history um, for them. So when they first got here, everyone was freaking because if they do bite birds and humans and they come out during the day and they are potential vectors of West Nile, they thought that it was going to be a really serious concern. But they prefer humans to birds. Uh, so they don't, the chances of them picking it up from a bird to give to a human aren't that high. So. There's a question there. Ainsley, when, when we uh, encounter mosquitoes in the field, there, there are some that are very fast and they're <laughs> tough to kill. But, but sometimes in the spring or in the fall, there are some that are kind of big and... and, uh, and Those would be the chilocetas. So, so is the speed a, a fact, that something that you can use for dis differentiate species? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. But <clears throat> I know that the ones that come out in the spring, the chilocetas and anopheles, the ones that overwinter as adults. Um, so they'll emerge in the spring and sometimes even if you'll just have like a warm day in the winter before spring comes, you might find them flying around your house and chances are they were overwintering in your basement, especially if you have a sump pump or anything nice and damp down there for them. Um, and so yeah, I kind of have noticed that in the spring when they come out, they're, they're not all that quick. <laughs> Any other questions? Robin? <laughs> no, I haven't got a chance to name one yet. Well, I had some questions, but um, <clears throat> it was more about, so you identify cryptic species, um, or a couple of them that could be potentially cryptic. And I noticed that one of them, uh, Ponty uh, uh, Penis, Ponte is very, um, so you have high divergence, <clears throat> but you also have a very broad geographical uh, mm -hmm. distance in between. <clears throat> so obviously that probably has to do with a, a broader kind of phylogeographic structure of that species. <clears throat> but in the case of the uh, Walkeri, um, you have a similar divergence in a very, very small area, mm -hmm. basically across a lake. So what, what would you think could potentially cause that? You know, I really don't have any idea because uh, on Manitoulin Island, I also collected punctopenis because I thought maybe, well, maybe it's an island thing. Um, but I also collected punctopenis and quadrimaculatus on that island, and they were no different from the punks, or, or yeah, the punks and the quads from the rest of Ontario. So I really don't know, but what's kind of interesting and fun about that is that uh, Anopheles walker I. Uh, was described by an entomologist whose name was Walker, who had a cabin on Manitoulin Island. And so <clears throat> he actually wrote a really interesting book once in the 50s talking about how he had been studying the insects at his cabin for decades and um, he was noticing, he was talking about climate change way back then. Um, so I actually think that the Walker eye everyone thinks is Walker eye was the one that he described for Manitoulin Island, which could be very different from the Long Point and the rest of the population. So that was definitely something that I wish I'd had more time to look into. One question. I was just curious, just to follow up on that idea, because at the beginning you mentioned how you might get um, divergence between groups um, that overlapped in their range, but because they're using different resources or um, they had different mm -hmm. behaviors and things like that. And you, you had one group where there was a huge, I can't remember what it was, but something like 56% or something, a huge divergence within the group, but they were all in the same locations and you're mm -hmm. like, I don't know what's going on there. But it, couldn't it just be that they are actually different species that just look the same but have different habitats, that's why, or uh, different sort of preferences, that's why they don't interbreed? Well, I don't think so because the ITS-1 uh, se like, sequences in general were very, I, I don't know, I guess pattern's not the right word, but with, with CO1, with the barcoding gene, um, <clears throat> the differences are more meaningful because if there's a lot of differences, it, would, it could, in theory, change. 
um, the amino acid sequence or, or whatever. Whereas with the internal transcribed spacer sequences, because a lot of them is kind of meaningless, I don't know, meaningless is a, not a, probably a good word to use, but um, yeah, I just wasn't sure. And because the CO1 and ITS2 for that didn't agree with the ITS1 for quads, that's kind of why I didn't really, that's why I had all the big question marks there, because I wasn't sure. But one neat thing that I thought is kind of cool is the Anopheles early I1. Uh, there did seem to be uh, two groups between BC and the rest of the country, but not the divergence between those wasn't as much as with Punctipennis, uh, which uh, Anopheles early I, one of the reasons that I said that they wanted to call it Canada's National Mosquitoes is because there was a group of researchers who were studying beavers and they opened up the top of a lodge in the winter and when they opened that up, there's thousands of Anopheles early I in there and some of them were um, blood fed and some of them were gravid and so they hypothesized that maybe this is where Anopheles over, early I overwinter is in the beaver lodges and so wherever beavers are probably why there's early eye too and you can see in their distribution that it, it follows the tree line quite nicely which I don't suspect there's beavers north of so <laughs> any other questions okay well thank you very much Ainsley that's very informative <laughs>